Um, yes, this is not about artificial life Apologies. as a noun, but rather about structures. And my table mate reminds me of a great experience I had about a year ago um, when I was uh, doing a desk script upstairs in the uh, 300 studio, third semester graduate housing. And in that desk script, hugely talented group of students uh, representing a housing plan at like sixteenths of an inch, one to two hundred scale, schematic design. And um, part of my feedback was to perhaps think about this uh, more structurally, and I was referring to agglomeration systems and housing typologies and how things could be, I guess, a bit more organized. Um, and so the next meeting, a couple of days later, a student came back and there were all these I-beams mm. spattered all in the plant, same drawing, a bunch of I-beams everywhere. <laughs> and I was wondering, where do all these I-beams come from? I'm not looking at anybody in particular. Um, and so this could be actually the beginning when we're talking about um, structures. The term in our world, oh, that's not there. Supposed to be a little bit of a color differentiation that doesn't pick up. But anyway, um, so in architecture, we, you know, we have a particular interest in structures, one could say, and there are these two, two meanings of the term, right? And the, the very happy miscommunication last year might be uh, an example for that. So on the one side, we have the, the general sense of the word that refers to patterns of organization, um, systems of organization or patterns, and then the other one that's specific about <laughs> the redirection of forces, uh, building structures, that is. Um, I, I thought that was a wonderful moment. Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, in the adjacent fields, or maybe not quite so alien disciplines, um, to use one of the terms that we established here in the seminar uh, of social sciences, the term is equally prevalent and um, technical. And uh, the STEM um, brings about uh, several technical terms, and one of them here, structuralism. Um, the subjects here are about the, the human condition, however, uh, not so much about building structure, organization in a sense, but really about um, what we as humans uh, do and what we think, how we perceive things, how we feel. That's how it started, anyway. Um, it began about 100 years ago, a little more. We had the Swiss linguist and semiotician and philosopher Ferdinand de Saussure, who is considered, I think, the father of structuralism. And um, I'm sure those of you who take Gorkhan seminar are very familiar with the origins of structuralism. Then it was adopted in the humanities, um, Claude Lévi-Strauss. Uh, discussion of the archetypes have been particularly popular, I would say, in architecture in the late 20th century, as the idea of the archetype, the recurrent symbol, or the recurrent motives are easily relatable in design community. Uh, several thinkers that we addressed here in the seminar already are associated with post-structuralism, Deleuze, Foucault, Derrida, um, who started with a critique of structuralism and continued that current into what's called now post-structuralism. Um, continuing very briefly with the uh, adjacent or perhaps alien fields just to frame what we're actually doing here today, which is very much um, based in the architecture, school and building. Um, 
There's a specific theory in the social sciences with the beautiful name structuation. And I was thinking this morning that maybe with structuation and individuation, a la Simon Don, um, we discussed this a couple of weeks ago, with those two terms alone, we could probably elaborate the problem of design quite nicely. The beauty of this technical term is structuration is that it brings together structure with agency, considers the two, in fact, inseparable. It discusses the micro and the macro, and to quote, these properties make it possible for practices to exist across time and space and lend them systemic form. Agents, group, or individuals draw upon these structures to perform social actions through embedded memory called memory traces. What could be more architectural than this? However, this is sociology, and uh, for many cases here today, we, for the case that we're making here today, it is considered perhaps alien. To be going, so here we, you know, we see the our poster um, with the set of terms, catchy terms perhaps. So we're, we're borrowing the term structuration from the social sciences, however, that's not really what we're talking about today. Um, perhaps to set up a search for some connections or structural, indeed, relationships. Yet we're staying you know, in familiar territory, grounded, if you will. The point of departure here today is not in those adjacent fields, um, we're really not talking about philosophy at all um, or social sciences. And the last time that I was uh, tasked to address structural design, which is the more familiar territory, I guess, um, the, context, the context was truly uh, geeky. That was the Arcadia conference uh, last fall. environment, uh, the term is very broad, um, so in, in this particular case it was about computational methods of structural design, and, and it may refer to the design of structures or structures of design, including physical building structures, urban structures, data structures, blockchain structures, and it reminded me of something that Cecil Bauman uh, mentioned uh, when he was speaking about structures and the definition of structures and saying that they're not limited to the redirection of physical forces but may elaborate connective patterns of information of all kinds. Um, there's a cast of characters that I want to refer to. Um, it's a pretty diverse group. There's no philosopher in there, a couple of engineers slash architects in there, a chemist, um, and also historian of science or metallurgist that you guys might have read already, uh, Cyril Stanley Smith, we, we put out a reading of his. It's actually a, a fairly recent discovery of my own um, via Jesse Reiser. Um, really interesting book, particularly if you are considering um, the correlations and the differences uh, to approaching structure from humanities on the one side or social sciences on the one side and uh, material sciences, perhaps architecture and engineering on the other. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with Fry Otto. Uh, German architect and engineer, more known probably through his work as a structural engineer. Most of the famous projects are uh, built and designed in collaboration with other architects. Um, you probably have not heard of Heino Engel. This is the, the far pragmatic end of this group. Um, 
he devised a very rigorous uh, structure of organization model. And we, we want to start with Smith, but the, in terms of its uh, uh, chronological order, Durand is the main character, who is the father of what we refer to as the science of architecture for the last 200 years or more, topology that is, and Mendeleev who um, devised the periodic table. So this is uh, Smith, and I just pulled some quotes of his. Though my conclusions are related to structuralism in anthropology, linguistics, and psychology, I arrived at them by a totally different route. I started with the scientific analysis of atomic and microscopic visible, microscopically visible structures in solids. But I have been drawn into the study of these forms because I enjoyed looking at them. So I think it gives some um, agency the aesthetics and stuff that we here in the design community share probably with him, the fascination of the expressions, the looks of things, which is one thing that may be a bit outside of the mainstream when we're discussing um, these terms in academic uh, context. And then more importantly, perhaps, the, that he starts, starts to draw a distinction between the material approach and the perhaps theoretical approach, or specifically the approach through um, social sciences and humanities. This is one of, or the first visual in his book. Um, the uh, structure of metals on an atomic scale. It is actually a visualization, it's not an actual imaging of that atomic structure. The molecular structure of um, the bonding atoms uh, in metals, and I think this is actually uh, referring to steel in particular, um, put in, let's say, represented actually by a bubble diagram, but the thing he points out here are the eternal anomaly, anomalies, anomalies, uh, not normal, but anormal. The anomalies are actually strengthening the steel. Um, if we're thinking about, and we refer to crystallography and uh, uh, lattice formations at molecular structures, it is, in fact, the anomalies that are making the steel so tough. Um, I think that's one of the, the approaches he takes uh, towards the discussion of structures. And, and again, he sort of counteracts the, the theoretical with the material experience and also elaboration of uh, thinkers, modern and pre-modern and ancient um, Newton picked up the pebbles from this metaphoric beach with an intellectual objective in mind. But his ancestors in Paleolithic times picked up real minerals because he enjoyed looking at them. Quite inadvertently, he started with the chain of practice and craftsmanship and thought and thought that led to the diversity of specialized materials and generalized theories today. Um, this is a similar statement, just from his own perspective, his own biography. And here we have Democritus, you may remember from our talk about materialism and new materialism, perhaps the, the great-grandfather of materialism. And uh, so Smith says, Democritus spoke truly when he said that everything existing is the fruit of chance and necessity. Biologists have told how their interplay has given rise to organisms and environments. Acting in history, this interplay has somehow produced associations of body and human brain as a mechanism to extend the same mixed principles to larger world of thoughts and patterns, one that is capable 
a form, far more rapid evolution than was possible with the material interactions alone. So in a structuralist sense, he uh, equates the material evolution with the uh, evolution of human thought, um, assigning a more rapid pace to one than the other, but structurally considering both to be the same thing. This, just as a reminder of that uh, previous talk, this he is referring to the guy on the left side. I'm going to consider that be the same message. There's one statement, this is a slightly outside of perhaps the the content of this talk, but it is interesting, I think, because we are addressing disciplines in this course, and sometimes we refer to those outside of design as alien disciplines, a term that we made up. Um, but his understanding of interdisciplinarity, I think, is very interesting and um, important, in fact. That, in a nutshell, interdisciplinarity is not to be confused with all participants having no discipline or perspective or expertise, but rather um, that they uh, derive from the fact that the author started with a rather deep immersion in a single discipline. One cannot hope to understand the nature of interaction between impinning areas without a firm knowledge of at least one of them. Only on such a basic a basis can one appreciate when or where a given body of understanding has ceased to be fully applicable. So I think that's, at a side note, interesting to say interdisciplinarity is the coming together of experts or disciplinary thoughts rather than the lack of interdisciplinarity uh, at all. I think there's a, often a, a, some confusion about this, or perhaps it's just, a, I think, a particularly important position to take. Um, here again, he says that practically everything about metals, and uh, he takes examples of metals that is indeed his expertise, or that's his background, that could have been discovered with the use of recognizable minerals and charcoal fires was discovered and put to some use at least a millennium before philosophers of classical Greece began to point the way towards an explanation of them. It was not intellectual knowledge, for it was sensually acquired, but it produced a range of materials that continued to serve almost all man's needs in warfare, art, engineering, continually until the end of the 19th century. Um, so I think here again, and this might be a bit of a bit of a provocation in this particular setting where we are coming from both sides that is, philosophy and design. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about classification systems and the problem of classification systems, and perhaps the um, suggestion that a taxonometric approach in, in design and in the discussion of design itself maybe the more productive one, uh, if you compare taxonomy with typology. Um, and the taxonomy here, or the classification discussion here, actually circling around structures themselves. So it is about the structures, or the making, or the creation of structures of structures. How do you structure, how do you categorize structures? Um, just from a personal anecdotal uh, perspective, when I was in your situation, or maybe a little bit earlier, at the beginning of my architecture education, I was always fascinated by structures and um, saw them in you know, various design proposals and you know, realized projects, and always wanted to understand why, they're, you know, why would one uh, kind of structure be more um, applicable than another one. And the technical courses really never um, provided a true answer for a designer, I found. They were always, um, well, technocratic in the sense of the word that we define.
defined recently and weren't really giving too much of an anchor for it. So I was curious and what models are out there for you, for us, um, especially young designers to get that understanding. Um, so this is a little bit based in this sort of curiosity or in, or in that search. Um, this, by the way, that could have been in that other lecture of artificial light. This is a synthetic engine for uh, lightweight structures, creates feathers according to certain parameters, um, different kinds, if you will, types of feathers along a gra gradient spectrum emerge from it. So the term natural structures is now bringing together two discussions, one on the question of nature and the other of structures, and the combination of them is uh, a, a, a phrase, if you will, that Fry Otto has been using a lot, uh, coming uh, strictly from the engineering side, but also being a humanist uh, in, in some respect. You consider, we as in here now, uh, the concept of nature as uh, as it pertains to ecological thinking and building and uh, address the architectural mandate in the midst of a global climate crisis. I think that statement, at least the second part of it, um, could be the prelude to anything that we're doing, not only within architecture, um, but it is so pressing um, that I consider it to be the first thought or consideration for anything at all. But it's particularly important, I think, when we're discussing structures and our understanding of structures, our creation of structures, and how we categorize them. Um, and it points at the problem of distinguishing nature from technology and uh, perhaps uh, introduces a new understanding of living systems and ultimately natural structures. Um, some of these elements, by the way, are coming out of another seminar that I'm teaching, which is uh, related and perhaps um, part of the lineage that led to this course, non-tectonica. I'm not trying to plug anything here, but I'm going to teach that in spring. If anybody haven't had enough at that point, <laughs> um, there's another course where we go much more deeply into uh, the, the, the design practice or the uh, practice of design research and application, um, again, outside of a, a real studio context, but um, very, very hands-on. Um, so, I'm going to go through this very quickly. Because that will be probably the main topic in that seminar. Here we see such structural taxonomy, actually. Um, this particular one is um, from imaging produced with scanning electron microscopes. Um, and I'm going to talk about the organization of such matrices and their potential value in the design process. Um, the formation of taxonomies we consider here as a creative act in and of itself as it directs the search within an infinite space of possible structures. This is a, a reference actually to Deleuze and Guattari and their idea of the probe head and the probe space. It gives, it gives texture, this gives texture to that probe space. The taxonomy itself gives texture to that possible space of structures. And so we consider that taxonometric work as design work as it directs this search for these possible structures. And there are, that's the, those structures that are not realized yet, they're not found yet, but they can exist, or perhaps they must exist. We have several examples of this. Um, let me just see if I have um, the Mendeleev slide in here as well. Um, Um, anyway, let me continue with Durand and um, the distinction between classification systems coming from a taxonometric approach, uh, which is coming out of biology versus uh, topology 
coming out of um, architecture. So our approach to classification is taxonomy, not typology, even though typology is the disciplinary method associated with architecture, um, while taxonomy is associated with the field of biology. At the end of the 18th century, Jean-Nicolas Louis Durand published, and I don't want to say the French, butcher the French title, but translated collection and parallel of buildings of all kinds, ancient and modern. Conceived as an aid for his teaching at the Ecole Polytechnique, it surveys every relevant building since classical time up to 1800. Here we see the category temples, for instance, and plan and section, and here the category churches. Durand wanted to systematize architectural knowledge and set out to create a, quote, science of architecture. For it, he developed the theory of type. Now we call it typology. That term is tossed around a lot. Um, perhaps after today, you know exactly what it means and what is the problem with typology. He creates a systematic method for classifying all kinds of building types. Here we see mosques, for instance, or libraries. And for it, he distills the buildings down to their most typical elements and lines them up in a pure Cartesian organization, a highly analytical method where you don't consider the context at all, things are isolated, the arms and legs are chopped off of the body to be um, operated on, and the patient might be dead, but the operation is successful. His classification method relies on the isolation of buildings from the historical and physical context. The sole focus is on the analysis of architectural form structure and organization, not to be distracted by urban context, historic context, or even grounding conditions. Here we see, for example, bridges, and even here, they are completely cut off, isolated from the terrain, if you consider that uh, contextual approach be important than anywhere else, um, than bridges, than bridges in particular, would be perhaps the extreme example of isolating the object of investigation in such an analytical method. He developed and promoted a structure to work typologically, working from precedence. We saw this programmatic uh, types here, palaces, um, but he catalogs facade elements and ornaments as well, suggesting the selection of combined types of domains. So in other words, uh, Originally, I think, one could say, um, when these schools of, well, uh, in the Bozart tradition anywhere were established, design education was, uh, in, to a large degree, the provision of these catalogs, and students would choose these types and combine from the catalog that discusses, let's say, planometric organization, one type and then from another catalog that discusses facade ornamentation, another type within that category, and they're basically just an additive process, something that we completely uh, left behind um, at the latest since the early 20th century, and very, very specifically since the 1960s, I would say, when ideas of contextualism have arrived and were prevalent when ideas of the synthesis of all kinds of design methods were promoted rather than the strict analytical and additive mode of picking and choosing elements. Um, it is indeed a picking and choosing of elements. Like if you're buying a Mac today, you say it's this model with the M3 chip and I wanna have that many uh, megabyte of storage or operating memory, you put these pieces together and there is the machine. That was principally the approach. I'm talking about it in critical terms and at the same time, um, I think we can identify value in this still today. So if you are, for instance, in your housing studio and you're doing a precedent analysis along certain categories, that is uh, based in typology a la Durand. 
Um, the following bit is from um, a book here that collects some of the work and thoughts that comes out of Nanotectonica addressing um, taxonomy and I mentioned that we are studying architectural and structural conditions and not biological ones, yet we are going via, approaching this via taxonomy rather than typology. And now you know what typology is, that is the scientific method of architecture that Durand has developed or introduced some 200 years ago. So typology refers, and this is a little bit more conceptual in its approach to discussing the dis distinction, taxonomy classifies according to observable and measurable characteristics. It has no idealized point of reference or datum. Typology, on the other hand, refers to concepts rather than empirical cases. So to idealized constructs rather than objects of reality. Perhaps our model of design is related more to speculative realities than it is to ideal types. So when exploring classification as a design method, we're privileging the taxonomic approach over the topological one. And in any case, we um, consider any form of classification system to remain open rather than closed. Closed classification systems do not hold much potential here in this argument for design innovation as to refer to a finite set of ideas. The ideas are already there. In the case of architectural typologies, uh, topologies to determine canon of building types and design expressions. They are self-referential systems that assume an essence for the categories that they established. Items assigned to these categories are thus essentially confined. They cannot migrate or unfold across categories. In this way, close classification systems prevent the growth and dissemination of ideas, including the innovation of design ideas. Open classifications, on the other hand, can stimulate speculation and the forming of ideas as they suggest unrealized potential. Notably refer to the multiplicity of such systems as we reject the notion that one classification system alone can serve as a generic sorting apparatus for all things that exist or could exist. We embrace the thought that there are infinite ways in which we can view the world and thus we explore the design potential of one taxonomy in an infinite set of such systems. Open classifications are temporarily anchored at nodes of similarities shared among observable objects, in this case structures, within a given field of exploration. The suggested, the suggestive moment of design innovation occurs when pairings of such associations describe an imminent yet not realized object. This is when the blind probing focuses the space of possible design ideas gains structure. Um, a model for such open system classification that stimulates innovation is Mendeleev's periodic table. All of you are familiar with it. And I just want to point at one particular characteristic here that points towards an open system of that kind and perhaps one that uh, stimulates design innovation. In this case, it comes, of course, from the sciences. It first directed the search for natural occurring elements that had not been discovered and more recently has governed the quest for possible elements, those that can be synthesized. So Mendeleev realized that the physical and chemical properties of elements were related to the atomic mass in a periodic way and he arranged them in a matrix so that groups of elements with similar properties fell into shared columns. So that part you know, right? That is sort of the, the general way of reading the, the chart or the periodic table. So significantly, he left holes in this matrix, open cells to be occupied by elements that were not discovered, but that would or could exist if his periodic laws were true. When Mendeleev published his periodic table in 1869, there were 59 elements on it 
and 33 open cells for missing elements. So if you see the dashes here, that's the original charge that he designed, and the dashes are those open cells, those holes in the matrix. He predicted the specific properties of the missing elements and thus directed the search for them, accelerated the discovery, which was concluded during his lifetime. Since the synthetic elements have, since then, synthetic elements have been created. Those that were not predicted by Mendeleev, but that fit in the systematic of his periodic table. Encouraged by a system of open classifications, scientists created new elements by slamming existing ones into each other as an analog to speculative design. In our discussion, we consider this a form of directed blind probing. Here we see one of those elements, um, un unpentium, um, not the unattainable um, element, but that is an artificial, that is a synthetic element created. Um, I'm going to migrate over to Friotto because and he uh, presents us with another example for such open classification. Um, and it refers, of course, to the classification of structure systems. Here we see him, Fry Otto, on one of his own structures. Um, he passed away a few years ago, 2015, uh, just, I think, two weeks before he was named the 40th recipient of the Pritzker Prize. Uh, uh, I think formerly the highest honor of architecture. You see, uh, so according to, and, and this I think is beautiful, and I'm not quite sure in how much I put these words in his mouth, but I, I, I think that he said this, that natural structures are those that we have been, oh no, he says that natural structures are those that we have been occupying for tens thousands of years, but not entirely understood uh, or put into meaningful relations. That what I, think is so significant uh, is that he considers all those structures, and that's what I wanted to quote him, but I don't have the actual words here. He said, um, I paraphrase, all structures that have been undergoing an optimization process are considered natural structures. Um, that, I think, not so much the optimization part, but that it really doesn't matter if this is a, you know, a grown carbon-based uh, structure or an engineered or a design structure it equally is part of the natural world and it is a natural structure if indeed it has undergone such evolutionary process. Um, I quite like these diagrams of this. Probably no need to translate those, but you see that in this, within the same um, diagram or sketch, we have the living and the non-living nature, we have the human artifacts, the, the technique, the, the, the technical expressions and artworks on the right side, and we have the emergent of biological uh, processes through evolution on the left side, one continuum influx condition rather than a strict separation of those uh, conditions. And this is the part, perhaps, um, where we could say analogous to Mendeleev's periodic table, that it is a open classification system. And this ma matrix um, of uh, principles and applied structures of open cells distinguishes. Um, he invites us, similar to Mendeleev, to actually fill in the blank spots. So, in a certain sense, directing the search, like Mendeleev directed the search for the elements, so Fry Otto does direct or stimu stimulate, uh, stimulate us to search for structures, in this case, structures in the most, in the closest sense of the word, building structures, structures of, that redirect forces. 